Hi everyone, my name is Tina Darling and I am um, the founder of Wednesday's Wonder Women and I wanted to share my journey with you first in hopes that putting my story out there and making myself vulnerable it might give you the confidence to share and seek out your joy from your story. My um, parents got married when I was five years old in Chicago, that's where I'm from, and they said they were moving me to Sarasota, Florida. So we started our journey down here. I was very sad about leaving my grandma and my grandpa, and the first place we went was Siesta Key Beach, and when I saw the white sand, I thought it was snow, and I thought that they had lied to me, and I thought that I had left my grandma Barb and my grandpa behind for nothing and I was very upset with them until I got to feel the sand and the warmth and experience paradise. Um, my parents were both entrepreneurs. My dad owned a painting company. My mom was a realtor and also owned our own home health care agency. And um, a few years later they had my little brother Mike and several years later they had my little sister Rebecca and we were one big happy family. Um, everything from the outside looking in was a normal family. My dad coached baseball and soccer and my mom coached cheerleading and managed our softball teams. And we ate dinner together every night as a family and we had an amazing life. When I turned 14, I got kind of out of control and started running with the wrong crowd and my parents gave me the option of moving to South Dakota with my grandma, who had now um, been divorced from my grandpa for several years. Um, he was her third husband and my mom's stepfather, and, um, or I could stay here and get my shit together. But I decided to move to South Dakota and be with my grandma. So that's what I did. and. Um, when I got there, it was, it was great. It was a totally different lifestyle and I had a little bit of culture shock um, and it was super cold. It made Chicago pale in comparison. And, but I made a lot of good friends and I had a good life going. And when I was 16, my grandma's husband, my grandpa, thought that he would um, try to reconcile with her. And unbeknownst to me, um, all this family drama started happening. And I wanted to know why. I um, kept eavesdropping on conversations and trying to get people to tell me what was going on. And my parents wanted me to come back to Florida. And I couldn't understand why they didn't want me there and with him or around him. I mean, I was a 16 year old girl who was just happy that her grandma and grandpa were getting back together. And in all the family drama, um, it came out that when my mom was a 14 year old little girl, her stepfather, my grandpa, had come home from the bar one night that he worked at, drunk and abused her um, physically and sexually and raped her. He raped his 14 year old stepdaughter and she got pregnant. And that's how I came about. And I don't know how, like, how I took it at first. I took it like any other 16-year-old cocky teenager, I guess, would take it. I was just like, whatever. Like, it's no big deal. But it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. Um, I had to come to grips with 
the grandpa that I grew up knowing and, and loving um, was actually my biological father. I had to come to grips with the fact that the dad I grew up knowing and loving was not my biological father. And when it hit me that I was um, the product of the worst thing ever. Like when you ask people what's the worst crime you can imagine, it's sex crimes against children. And I was the result of that. That's what I was. I was the result of the worst crime ever. And I, um, that's what I saw when I looked in the mirror for the next 30 plus years. I looked in the mirror and I saw the offspring of a rapist. I saw the genetic makeup of a pedophile. I realized that all of his family, even though he was a stepfather, all of his family was really my family. And, um, and I thought that that's what other people saw too. So the self-doubt, the self-loathing, the never thinking that I was good enough, um, set in and it took over. Um, I had romanticized through the years childbirth and like how babies come to be. You know the story. Mommy and daddy fell in love and decided that they were going to have a family and um, or even if it's not that romantic, even if it's, you know, um, me and my boyfriend had a surprise pregnancy, but we loved you nonetheless, but, you know, or even if it's IVF um, and it's not romantic at all, it's purely scientific, but it was still conceived out of love. And I was not. I was conceived by a criminal and a monster. And that's all I could see when I looked at myself. That's all I could see. I thought that that's all everybody else could see too. Um, if I didn't get invited to go somewhere, I thought it was because of that. I thought it was because I wasn't good enough. If I wasn't included in a family photo, I thought it was because I wasn't really considered family. Um, and that went on. I was 17 when I had my daughter. I had at that point spent almost two years knowing the truth about myself and wondering like, how did my mom look at me every single day with unconditional love in her heart and her eyes? I didn't know and I didn't understand until I gave birth to Elizabeth. <laughs> the second they put her in my arms, I knew that no matter how I had her, that was unconditional love. She was my anchor. She's still my anchor. One of them. But I started to understand how my mom could still love me. 
I know that looking at me had to be a constant reminder for her. And I don't know how she did it. She was the strongest woman I knew. And then I married Elizabeth's father and moved back to Florida and tried to go on with my happy life and my new baby and be back with my parents and my siblings again. But there was just always that nagging self-doubt. There was always this perspective I had, this filter that I saw everything through. If um, my mom and dad and Mike and Becky would go out to dinner and I wouldn't get invited, I would think it was because I wasn't a Mivshek. Um, maybe they just didn't invite me because they knew I was doing something with Elizabeth that night. It was always something. And it hurt. It always hurt. And I knew they never hurt me intentionally. But I just kept growing these fears. Insecurity, self-doubt, disgust. So I surrounded myself with people who treated me that way. I, um, I went for dead-end jobs that didn't value me because I didn't value me. I made friends with people who weren't loyal to me because I didn't think I deserved their loyalty. I let people disrespect me. I let men disrespect me because I thought that's what I deserved because of who I was and what I was. I never saw the value in Tina Mipshek. And I just um, struggled with it daily. And then I reconnected with Jamie from eighth grade, Jamie. And I knew what it felt like now to be loved unconditionally. Before we even started dating, somebody else had told him my story. And he didn't care. He loved me anyway. with his whole heart. And he tells me every day that I am enough. He assures me all the time that I have value. We had a baby together. That was Mikey. <laughs> we did everything backwards, by the way. First we fell in love, then we had a baby, then we bought a house. And then I said something about wanting to go to college, but it not being the right time that I needed to be there for my kids. And he said, you'll always need to be there for your kids. And I'm like, right, but maybe in a couple years when Mikey starts school, he's like, but then you're gonna wanna be involved with Mikey's school. The kind of husband that he is, and was then, was exactly what I needed, but definitely what I didn't think that I deserved. When Mikey was four months old, Jamie proposed to me in the cutest way ever. It was Easter Sunday and he came over to the dinner table at a restaurant and he turned Mikey around wearing a shirt that said, Mommy, will you marry my daddy? And it had a wedding ring hanging from it. The whole family was there. The whole restaurant was watching. All the women were crying, even the ones that didn't know us. 
And I was thinking, well, I better say yes because one of them's going to take him up on it in a minute. And of course I said yes. Still thinking I didn't deserve him. Right up until the day. And I got ready, got my hair did, got my makeup done professionally, did the photo shoot with all my bridesmaids, all that stuff. And then they were like, it's time to put on your dress. And I said, no. And the whole room froze. And I said, I don't want to put on my dress because he's not going to be here. My mom was like, of course he's going to be here. I'm like, if he doesn't show up, I can't be standing here in my wedding gown and left at the altar. So I put on my bathrobe and I went and I sat in the bathroom and I looked out the window of the mansion at the long driveway and I peeked through the little window thinking guys like him don't marry girls like me. And I saw the limo coming and I thought for sure he wasn't in it. The first person to get out was my dad. And then he reached in and he pulled Mikey out. And then my brother and all the other groomsmen. And I just held my breath. And Jamie climbed out of the limo, put on his sunglasses, took our son in his arms, and looked straight up at me. He saw me in the window, and he just made eye contact. And I was like, holy shit. Guys like him marry girls like me. So here I am with this amazing husband. I went back to college, or I went to college. He helped me through it all. He got up and he went to work at 6 a.m. He got off at 2 p.m. He picked up the kids. He coached softball. He made dinner. He helped with homework. He gave baths. And he was sitting up waiting for me when I got home from school. In all my years in college, I don't think I ever washed a load of laundry. He did it all. I never did the dishes. He did them all. He didn't want me to change, but he supported me in every move I made to change. And I was still thinking that I didn't deserve him. I was still thinking that I wasn't good enough. We built our family. We, I graduated college with honors. My degree is in computer science. And we, we had a great honeymoon. We took vacations. We spent lots of time in Orlando and SeaWorld with our kids. And I still didn't feel like I deserved him. I started this business, it was just working for a couple agents. It gave me the flexibility to, you know, raise my kids and take care of my grandma while she was sick and back up my dad with my mom. And um, I lost my grandma Barb in 2003. We never really discussed it. I never wanted to talk to her about it because I have no idea how she felt. And the fact that I found out that even after she knew, she still considered taking him back. She still believed him when he said it wasn't true. 
and I can't imagine the guilt she felt when he didn't come and take the blood test that he promised he would come and take. I can't imagine that she felt how she felt having doubted her daughter for one minute. My mom didn't tell her until I was 12, until after my grandma Barb had divorced him. Um, I just didn't talk to her about it. And after she passed away, I, I didn't regret not talking to her about it. I didn't have a lot of questions, but I, I had a lot of anger starting to build up. Why, when she found out, why didn't she just instantly believe my mother? Why didn't she see my mother for the victim that she was? Why didn't somebody get my mom help? Why didn't somebody get me help? They dropped this bomb on me when I'm 16 years old and I'm just supposed to deal with that? I was so pissed off at everybody for the longest time. And after my mom's brain hemorrhage, my little brother and sister found out because my mom's um, the part of my mom's brain that was injured was the censorship part. So they both got to find out in dramatic ways. Um, I never wanted them to know. I never wanted them to see me as their half-sister. Um, that destroyed me, them knowing. And it just kept building the anger, the loathing, I guess there's stages of stuff. I know there's stages of grief and there's stages of all these different things, but I was going through all the stages. So I'm building this business. I'm suppressing all of these feelings because I've got kids to raise. I've got a husband to be a good wife to. I've got a business to run. Um, and I'm just suppressing it all. I'm holding it all inside. And on 4th of July, 2006, I was leaving SeaWorld after watching the fireworks with my husband and my little boy. And I got the call that my dad had just had a heart attack and died. I never got to tell him thank you he never wanted to talk about it with me bottom line he was my dad that's all there was to it nothing to discuss that's how Dean Mipshek rolled end of conversation I am your dad, period. And I never got to say thank you because he was my dad by choice. He made that decision. That rocked my world. My mom was physically and mentally disabled from her brain bleed and my siblings and I spent the next eight years, nine years, rotating her from house to house, taking care of her. She'd spend six months at each house. It was a lot of work. My mom was a drug addict, a victim who had never gotten help. She was an amazing grandma to my kids. She couldn't sing but she could dance. <laughs> she laughed at her own jokes louder than anybody else in the room. We took care of her because we promised my dad that we would. When we made that promise, we never thought that she would outlive him, but um, 
I just kept suppressing it. I had too much going on. I, you know, husband, kids, career, first grandma, then dad, now taking care of mom. And then my mom passed away in 2014. One day I was talking to her on Christmas. She said everybody had a cold and she was hoping not to catch it. Five days later, I got a call from my sister that said, happy birthday. By the way, mom's lips are blue, so I'm taking her to the ER. I had turned into pneumonia. And when they got to the hospital, um, she had a heart attack. So I flew to LA and me and my brother and sister, and my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, made the decision to turn off the life support. When I walked into the room, she looked at me and scowled. And I said, what's wrong? And she pointed at her mask. And I said, you don't want it. And she shook her head no. And I said, you want us to turn it off? And she gave me the thumbs up. And I said, you know what happens, right? And she gave me the thumbs up. So I had a little bit of time alone with her. I thanked her because I didn't have the chance to thank my dad, so I made sure I thanked her. And she had her head, hand on my hair, and my brothers and sisters all came back into the room. The doctors did what they had to do. We turned on some Fleetwood Mac. Lane Slide was playing and she left. She wanted to be with my dad. It's what she had prayed for every night. She got what she wanted. Mike and Becky and I had a hard time after that. Um, our parents were young, so technically, we shouldn't have lost them until I was in my 80s. But here we were orphans in our 20s, 30s, 40s. And it was a lot to deal with. So I was dealing with that. I was always dealing with something, but never got to deal with my something. And then my kids grew up and Mikey was turning 18, graduating from high school and something happened um, to me physically. I went to the doctor because I was getting really bad headaches and my blood pressure was through the roof. I was overweight, but I'd still always had low blood pressure. And he said, um, it's, he ran all the tests, all the medical tests. My heart was fine, my liver was fine, my kidneys were fine, everything was fine. And he said, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? And I was like, nothing. I'm like, life is pretty good. Like, things are back to normal with my siblings and my husband and I are doing great. We're about to be empty nesters. We've never lived alone. We're excited about what's ahead of us. I own a marketing company. He's like, well, that's pretty stressful. I'm like, but it's always been stressful. Like, I'm, everything's fine. And he was like, well, there's nothing medical going on. So I'd like you to see a therapist. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, nothing's changed. And he's like, a lot's changed. And now your grandma's gone, your dad's gone, your mom's gone, your kids are grown up, your business is successful, your marriage is happy. But something's changed in you. And 
your body is telling you it's time for you to deal with it. I didn't even feel like I deserved the right to deal with it. He told me to go to a therapist and heal myself. And I didn't even feel like I deserved the right to do that. I found a therapist. I sat down like a teenager, a petulant teenager. And she's like, so what brings you here? I was like, my doctor. And she's like, well, what's going on? And I said, my blood pressure went up. And she's like, okay, well, I said, I don't know. He did all the physical tests, said everything's fine. I'm overweight, but you know, I mean, I was 232 pounds. I said, but I've been overweight for a long time. So I don't know why that would just all of a sudden make my blood pressure go up. She's like, so let's talk about what's going on in your life. And I was like, I said, well, I hope you have a legal pad because that little notebook's not gonna do it. And I started telling her my story and she's like got her eyebrows raised and she's taking all these notes. And I went for a year and I was doing the work and I wasn't getting any better. Um, I mean, medication was keeping my blood pressure down, but I was still overweight. I was still unhappy. I was still feeling unworthy. I had surrounded myself with all these successful business people and, you know, thinking if I seek out success and happiness um, that it would rub off on me or something. And um, I couldn't, I couldn't do the breakthrough. I couldn't break through what I needed. Um, I, I told her everything and I was waiting for her to tell me how to fix it. And I guess that's not how therapy works. Um, but I was like, am I supposed to be doing something? Am I like, is there a treatment? Am I like, or am I just broken? I'm like doing the work and I'm not getting any better. And I think I was 47, almost 48 years old. And I'm happy on the outside. Everybody who knows me is like, Tina Darling, you know, what a great name. And I'm like, yeah, no, life is great. And I was faking it till I was making it. And I was making it, but I wasn't dealing with it. And I love my husband with all my heart but I still didn't feel that I deserved his love. And I loved my siblings, but I didn't feel like they loved me as much because of this. And I love my kids with every ounce of my being. And at the time I had three grandchildren, um, one from Elizabeth, and one from Casey, who we call my other daughter, basically grew up in our house, Elizabeth's best friend. I had two boys from her, and Ophelia from Elizabeth. Jaden, Carson, and Ophelia were Yaya's babies, and outside looking in, everything looked great, but I was still a mess. And then something happened that, cha happened that changed it all. So stay tuned. <laughs>